Let's get underway. Um, it's my really distinct pleasure to introduce Walt Skarki this afternoon. Um, for those of us long in the tooth, which actually really means for those of us with receding gums, um, we remember, you know, kind of in 1982, this absolutely classic paper that, uh, that Walt wrote together with Rob Kling on the web of computing, which to me is very much at the center of what our department is. It's what the center of what our field is. And he's really accompanied the field of informatics um, in innovative ways ever since, you know, those days of the early inception. Um, Walt is the director of, the, of research at the Institute for Virtual Environments and Computer Games, both at UCI. Received his PhD here in 1981, then he was a professor at uh, USC and returned here in 1999. His research interests include uh, computer game culture and technology, virtual worlds for modeling and simulating complex socio-technical processes, uh, cyber infrastructure of open uh, architecture systems, open software, uh, source software development and software acquisition practices in the DOD. He's had a huge um, fan of um, 70 odd externally funded research projects um, and he's, uh, as well as a number of um, uh, consulting positions. He served as co-chair for the 8th International Conference on Open Source Systems in 2012, co-chair of the third Games and Software Engineering Workshop at the 200, uh, 2013 International Conference on Software Engineering. And his co-organizer, even as we speak, he is running a workshop on another side of campus. I mean, this is, this is the ability of the man um, on eSports, the eSports Symposium at UCI. Um, he's the killer for the catchy title. So the title of his talk today is Game-Based Stroke Re Rehabilitation Challenges and Scaling to National Clinical Trials. Welcome, Walt. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so, oops. No, it's right. No, I forgot something. Okay, so this is a shout cast, so for those of you in the back, if you <laughs> bet you need to tell, let me know. Okay, uh, so uh, I am not a neuroscientist, but I do work with people who are, so this is uh, work that's uh, Latin pioneered by Steve Kramer who runs the Neural Repair Lab at the uh, Stem Cell Research Center over in the School of Medicine. Steve's an active clinician, so that means he's seen patients in the hospitals, but he's also a, uh, an active faculty member teaching uh, medical students about uh, neurology, neuro anatomy, neurobiology, physical medicine, and rehabilitation, and he's the, currently the head of the National Institute of Neurological Disease, disorders and Stroke uh, Executive Committee for StrokeNet and more. Okay, I thought I was busy till I met Steve. So, <laughs> um, so kind of what I want to do today is uh, tell you about you know what it's like to be um, you know an informaticist going to work with uh, uh, people who are focusing on healthcare. Um, as could we certainly have a growing capability in the department with uh, Yunnan Chen Kai, uh, also you in the audience today. Uh, but I've also kind of been both awed and fraught with the complexities of what is entailed when one tries to do these very large uh, healthcare kinds of studies. Because uh, most of the time we're spending our efforts doing, let me call it research logistics. You know, we're on the phone, we're answering questions of, my game doesn't work, it's like, is it turned on? It's like, oh, is it, you know, and it's like, I mean, you, uh, because it's part of the thing of, we're used to, uh, in our community, dealing with people who have full ability. That's sort of the starting point. But now if you start to think about people who, who have less than full ability, uh, who, and who are predominantly elder, uh, and who've lost ability, what does that mean if we're gonna try to provide a uh, therapeutic, <coughs> or, uh, rehabilitatory uh, intervention to try to help them improve the quality of life? Uh, so I'm gonna tell you about, you know, ultimately this is gonna lead to telling you about what the system is and how it's designed and why we think it's, uh, it can, it has the potential to be transformative for these people. So, uh, the opening frame that I want to try on is, um, you know, certainly as Jeff, Paul, and many others are 
uh, you know, among our leading uh, experts in uh, social studies of science, uh, STS studies and the like. And so the kind of science that we're going to be looking at today is what I'm choosing to call health science rather than medical science. Because medical science, I'll say, is typically going to be situated around hospital or medical cures or the use of drugs uh, as interventions. And health is going to instead focus on, rather than curing people, caring for people who cannot be cured kind of a thing. And I call it an applied focus. I'm not holding this up as a benchmark. I'm just trying to contextualize it as a way for understanding and advancing uh, care practices through uh, by being both adaptive and by understanding that a lot of the things we can control are in some sense the technical configurations, but those are situated in very complex and fluid uh, social arrangements. But ultimately what we're trying to do is to think about how to improve the quality of life, both for the stroke survivors and for the people that care for them. And it's also the secondary issue that is mostly under addressed in, the, uh, in that community of people. So uh, I'm not holding this up again as a benchmark. So uh, the methods are not trying to uh, be high fidelity. Instead, they're just sort of lightweight, adaptive, uh, and the like. Oops. Hello. And one of the other things I think uh, I've chosen to do is to say that um, you know, much of the face of uh, information work, of care work, is invisible, as we're well aware. So I'm trying to help inform my own work by trying to understand, well, where is it visible? So I've had the personal experience of, of being with uh, two people who each late in life had strokes. This is my father and my mother. Uh, so my mother was the primary caregiver for my father but ended up, uh, ended up not outliving him, uh, which turns out to be a fairly common outcome. That is, the caregiver is at much at risk uh, for quality of life issues as the uh, stroke survivor themselves. So with that, let me dive in to the project to say, okay, while well, I've acknowledged uh, Steve as the principal investigator, there are a lot of people on this project. Uh, I've listed uh, sort of the ones that I see every week, uh, but altogether there's about 60 people in this study uh, across 11 different or 12 different hospital or clinical uh, locations or healthcare markets, if you like, and we'll talk about those. Uh, so we have at total at, at the UCI cluster about 20, 23 people just focusing on this one project. And thus, again, once we have about 40 plus people uh, on the, uh, 50 plus people on the outside trying to help us. Okay. So, um, uh, I've never been involved in a study at a national scale. I am not the research designer. This is not my research methodology. No, I'm sort of uh, a passenger. Uh, as I said, I'm the informaticist. I walked in and this is what they were set up to do. Uh, but, um, you know, you can kind of see our geographic distribution in, uh, on the left side. And if any of you, let me ask the question, does anyone know anyone who's had a stroke? Okay, so a number of you raise your hand. It's about 0.3% um, of the population has a stroke per year. Uh, I'll get into some of the background in a moment. So if you, have, if you know anyone who's a current stroke survivor within, uh, let's say, driving distance of any of these, please let me know because one of the things you do is you constantly recruit for, for subjects to participate because uh, it's hard to get people to uh, join these studies because uh, there's lots of factors which I'll talk about. But do see me afterward because Part of our mission is to continue to find people to participate in these studies. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what's involved in stroke and stroke tell rehabilitation and rehab and where games may fit in. Okay, so, so this is some background. Okay, so uh, a stroke, two kinds of stroke uh, count for the world. Uh, which simply amount to 
clots, or what are called ischemic uh, strokes, and hemorrhage, which of course are ruptures. Okay, and if you're in the U.S. and you've had a stroke, uh, you can generally you're generally brought to a hospital where they quickly try to diagnose you to figure out are you a clot or are you a hemorrhage? Because if you're a clot, they give you a blood thinner. If you're a hemorrhage, they give you a blood thickener. Okay, that's life saving. Okay, that's the life saving intervention. Oh. And uh, but you know that's one moment in time. Uh, and part of what we're going to see is that's a very short moment in a very long trajectory. Okay, because what happens after a stroke, meaning once you've stabilized, once you've fulfilled your time in intensive care and you start to get transitioned into a, a recovery facility, so you've left the hospital, uh, this is when uh, what's called motor control recovery, because usually a stroke is an impairment that causes a loss of motor control. And we'll talk about that a bit. Uh, and that what happens is you don't, you, lo you lose ability, okay? And everybody wants to know, how long will it be before I get back to the way I was? It's like, and the answer is most of the time you don't, okay? There are exceptions, and those exceptions are uh, pretty interesting, and they're only documented through qualitative anecdotal study. Uh, doesn't mean they're not valid, but they're out there. Okay, and the recovering these abilities has to do with things like comorbidity. So in the case of my father, uh, he had a stroke after, or while he had uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, he had a cardiovascular disease, so he had uh, arrhythmic. Uh, he'd already had a colonectomy, um, and uh, he was uh, diabetic, and uh, he also suffered from obesity. So this idea of comorbidities uh, also starts to point out the signature or precursors of people more predisposed to having a stroke. Uh, genetics is not one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, and that the rehab focuses on what are called activities of daily living. So um, can I feed myself? Can I wash myself? Can I clean myself? Okay. Uh, I'm not trying to focus on that because if people ha don't have those abilities, they're dependent entire, they're going to be in a care facility, okay? But for people who get to go home, they're gonna have, they're gonna deal with uh, instrumental activities of daily living. You know, for example, can I use one of these, right? Again, if you have full ability, it's like, you know, I don't even have to look at it. It's like, imagine, and I'm not trying to parody any, but, you know, or imagine trying to use your phone with your foot. That's kind of the comparable challenge. It's like, you have control over your foot, but this instrument is not designed or sees as the common experience this very limited ability to use the device. Most recovery and therapy is done at home, and now we start to get into some of the more persistent challenges of uh, about a third of stroke survivors experience clinical depression. Not a bad day, but I want to kill myself kind of days. Okay, uh, you know, so it's, uh, or one out of four also experience cognitive neglect. Think about the challenge of trying to design a system where the person sees it and they remember it and they sort of see there are affordances there about how to do something, but there's no, they don't have the ability to connect the dots and go like, oh, Here's what I do to do this. Okay, that's what we mean by cognitive neglect. Their perceptual systems work, but if you will, the mind has been uh, transformed because of the brain injury that they have. This leads to low rates of compliance, and then we get down to this stuff, uh, which is kind of, I think, more of the stuff I want to try to embrace, is, you know, people start to remove themselves from uh, social life, the world, and the life, which coincides with a decline in the quality of life, okay? So, in a sense, the thing we're gonna try to do with the game stuff is look at, well, we can't change stuff like this, 
because those are clinical conditions. But can we look at ways of improving compliance? Can we do something at home? Can we focus on these instrumental activities in ways that ultimately can lay a foundation for kind of uh, resolving or turning around isolation and perhaps improve quality of life? So just some facts and figures. Um, so in the U.S., we have about 800,000 stroke survivors per year. About a million people have a stroke. So that tells you there's people who don't survive it. Uh, it's about 15 million, 20 million. We don't, WHO doesn't mean World Health Organization doesn't have good figures for how many people experience a stroke per year. So given that the U.S. is a 20th of the world, yeah, that's where that number comes from. Uh, and as we said, it kind of depends, your survival rate depends on where you're at. So uh, if you're in Africa and you have a stroke, you don't have a good uh, likelihood of survive because again, you've got to get to that hospital for that key intervention. So about uh, 600, uh, pardon me, four, 500,000 are people who survive the stroke and then have this persistent motor control impairment which you see most visibly in the form of an upper extremity thing. Let me lift both hands, okay? Uh, or a lower extremity, so you see the foot drag. Or the one that's most, uh, you often see, uh, recognized as the, uh, 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 oh, uh, they've lost the ability, it's not that they can't think, but they've lost the ability to control the musculature, the breathing, in order to articulate words. In some cases, they can't even think of the word due to the cognitive neglect, so it's hard for them to know what to say if there's nothing, uh, or if there's, they have that diminished ability. So this was kind of, for me, a, wow, uh, number one cause of adult disability in the U.S. is stroke, okay, and it's number three worldwide. Does that mean it's worse? It, Again, it's kind of because most people in the world die from a stroke, which is what we have good survival rates, but we have high disability as a result. And so people are starting in the, med in the healthcare community are talking about stroke as being a chronic care uh, situation. It's a disease that you're going to live with. Okay. Uh, this is for the uh, dollars and cents. So it costs now about $20,000 a year for the first year of outpatient clinical rehab. That's not hospital, that's not medications, that's not drug doctor visits. That's going to work with a therapist, okay, usually in an outpatient clinic. Uh, and as we said, oftentimes, again, when I had this first-hand experience, the dropout rate's very high. You know, when my father, who had a uh, right side, uh, stroke, an ischemic stroke, the common male, uh, white male pattern in the U.S. Have a stroke on the right side, so you lose your left. But we also have that dominant behavior of right-handedness. So we've lost the, you know, the, the weaker side becomes even weaker, but we still have the dominant side, which means we have a quality of life in that eat, drink, care, uh, and the like. Oh, and it's not looking better for the future from a cost standpoint. Uh, so the $30 billion a year is kind of uh, uh, just going up. Um, but one of the things that in working with uh, my colleagues, uh, because I had that firsthand experience of, you know, under, trying to work with my, my parents with these things of, of just trying to get to and from the <coughs> clinic is a big deal. Okay. Uh, a one-hour clinic is a five-hour day. A one-hour clinic, because it's like you got to set up the logistics for going, being there, and then coming back. Uh, those costs aren't in those numbers. None of these costs are. Uh, oh, and what happens if you don't have, if you live by yourself? Or that you have to have a helper come in? Because again, the, the disease doesn't know your socioeconomic status, your family life, and the like. And again, if you've lost some of your abilities for things like <coughs> doing laundry, again, this is, that's the, you know, we all do it. We all take it for granted. 
But again, if you've lost that motor controllability of, you know, I can't do this, I only have this, okay. And again, if, it, if you're left-handed, it's like now, okay, it's even more challenging. Again, these are these act instrumental activities, bill paying, shopping, uh, and the like. Um, oh, something that happens to stroke patients, they have secondary tertiary strokes, sometimes called You'll hear them designated as TIA, transient ischemic attack, you know, which is, um, you know, that I'm just talking uh, 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 about what was happening in the world, okay? It's not a stammer. It's literally, you know, uh, a, it could be hypothetically a piece of plaque in your uh, cerebrovascular system that you're pumping through and it just puts a little dam in place which shuts down part of the, uh, your neurology and then something may be able to dislodge it and come along. Oh, and there's more. Okay, so that's our background. And now, as the game guy, what can we do to make this more fun and playful, okay? Um, this is not kind of the thing that most game people think about as being an interesting problem, but because I don't know better, I dive head, in, head first in. So we're trying to think about, okay, so how can we utilize things like uh, games, um, network information technology, uh, and these are all the things that the healthcare, you know, that Steve Kramer stuff put in, like, well, we could give them drugs, and uh, we could give them more education, and how do support groups work, and we can have cloud-based data, and it's like, you know, go put your favorite remedy here, kind of a thing. Uh, but the key thing is, you know, uh, if I've had a stroke and you've had a stroke, we have not had the same injury, okay? So there's very little generalization. Uh, the data analytics is at fairly coarse grain. Um, there's no epidemiology for who's predisposed to it, but there are demographic patterns. In the United States, the highest concentration of strokes is in the southeast. I'll let you hypothesize why you think that's the case. Uh, but as I said, if you look at comorbidities where you have uh, high levels of, of smoking, high levels of alcohol consumption, diabetes, obesity, uh, and you just look for where those people are, you start to see uh, correlations. Okay. So now I'm looking more like a, an IT kind of a person because I'm trying to think about, okay, how do we make this work in a low cost way? Uh, how do we not create an incredibly awesome system that a person with limited ability cannot use? You know, so uh, we don't talk about giving people an iPhone 7 as a starting point. Uh, because, oh right, yeah, uh, if you're poor and you have a stroke, it's like giving them fancy technology may, you know, is, is not an enabler to no surprise. Um, we're in that camp that believes in participatory design to a point, okay. Uh, meaning I'm part of the team, so I let them define what they think participation means. So they want therapists and physicists to be involved, uh, but when you say, how about patient input, they're like, Re remember cognitive neglects, remember clinical depression, how do we get those people, what does that mean for them to participate? It's like, uh, uh, friends, what's participatory design talk about when we have people who have clinical depression? Do we say anything about that? Or people with cognitive neglects, it's like, uh, we, don't, we don't have that, detailed knowledge. Um, they want to use standardized measures, that's part of the dogma of the discipline, um, a, a, as well as assessment, and oh, uh, we have institutional regulations, so we have HIPAA compliance that we have to do, we have FDA uh, compliance. Our approach is actually been uh, vetted for, and it is FDA compliant, uh, so we'll see what that means. Um, <coughs> translation. Okay, again, uh, Steve Kramer is the clinical director of the Institute for Clinical and Translational Sciences here. Um, so we gotta do translations, okay. 
So one of the translations that I said is, okay, so there's a lot of people uh, in like the HCI community or the uh, rehab engineering community uh, who are showing like, wow, we've got a game-based approach for doing stroke rehab. It's like, and a lot of them are just awesome technology. Uh, you know, because it's part of this thing of we have the believers, including me, games are really good at providing intrinsic motivation. I'm having fun, potentially, uh, doing this activity, but uh, most of the studies that are out there are singular. We built it, we published the paper, we're moving on to the next study, okay? Or our system is awesome. Have you actually had any stroke patients do it? Well, that's really an inconvenience. <laughs> Because I said, when you have people with limited ability who cannot just get to your laboratory to participate in a demo, or to, so uh, there are hundreds of papers and very little that you can uh, utilize from it, unfortunately. Uh, and then if we get to the clinical assessments by which they want to focus on, well, what works? And how do we know it works? And why? And is it generalizable? Um, again, it's part of the scientific method that in the way they embrace it, is that there tend to be relatively few or no recoverability assessment. Okay, we got this game and it works with a robot, and you know, you flex your arm a hundred times every day, and it's awesome. And people say it's really fun. It's like, well, did it make a difference in terms of standardized uh, assessment measures of recoverability? The kind of Recoverability we're looking for are what is called medically significant. So I can mime a notion of that. So if I've had a stroke on my left hemisphere, so I am and I'm a parisic on my right side. So if you ask me to lift both arms together by manual task, you'll see something like this. Or, you know, so. You know, one side's controlled and the other isn't so controlled. Um, and uh, now if you say, you want to shake my hand, okay? So I'm out here as a white male adult trying to shake your hand, okay? But it's gonna come like this, okay? A medically significant improvement is this. with an ability to have some grip, okay? Now, I didn't know this until I saw it, but once I saw people do this, it was it's a transformation of identity. I am a broken person to I am a person, or a whole person. And that was, again, I didn't, I didn't know to expect that, but boy, when I saw it, it was like, whoa. And it's like, that's the kind of, you know, we're not talking about, oh, I can go, drive a car or whatever, it's like just can we, can you do something that has an obvious enough, manif an observable manifestation that one can understand translates into a quality of life change. Um, okay. Uh, wow, again, looking at kind of the science back here, the theory of motor control repair is sort of not kind of there. Okay, neuroscience is really good on, here's how the synapses work when you give them this drug in this dosage in a rat. Okay, uh, but if you talk about, again, because everyone's different, okay, um, what usually happens in a stroke is you, re you have an impairment that kind of follows, if you can see where my hand is, just in front of my ear. It's, this is your parietal motor cortex, roughly. We do have that all, okay? That's your ability to do this and this and, and this. And there's a mapping. This is the most interesting model I've seen, the homunculus. Look this up on Wikipedia if you haven't. Uh, which maps your body onto the homunculus. So uh, your Upper extremity is here, then your lower extremity, then your speech, and down along here are things like nose, tongue, ear. 
So nose, tongue, and ear paralysis is very exotic. Because you know, if you think about my nose is paralyzed, what would that mean? Um, means well, it doesn't mean you've lost olfaction. It means you might not be able to you know, twitch your nose. So not necessarily a quality of life difference, but uh, upper extremity is at the top. You sort of have in my crude model you're a pressure gradient like a thermometer, and you know if it you know it pushes up, the upper extremity is in the highest part of your body. You know, it's <coughs> kind of a fluid physics kind of thing. But then, how does that connect to this idea of there being a control circuit? Okay, the paresis, the limited loss of motor ability, is directly related to distance to the control center. So fingertip control, like imagine picking up a dime, is indicates you have, to, you have to have very fine motor control ability to pick up a dime. And one of the common assessments given to stroke survivors is can you pick up a block, a wooden block, a child's wooden block, pick it up from the table, put it in a box. If you can do that, they give you a match stick, okay? And I sat with my father, at least on three occasions, where after, you know, because they're doing this as an assessment, where after about three minutes, he just does this, just, why the hell am I doing this? Because it makes no, he cannot see the connection, nor could I at the time, between that and an instrumental activity of daily living. You know, can I use the phone? Can I order pizza? Okay. So we have to think about, uh, What's the connection? Again, that's more a health science issue than an IT issue, uh, but it's probably an informatics issue. And then this thing of, well, my impairment is not yours, so we have to come up with personalized, individualized uh, interventions. Okay, so here's what we've come up with. Uh, so one, we're gonna focus on upper extremity, not speech, not lower extremity. Why? It's the largest subcategory. Uh, two, uh, for people with foot drag, uh, you have a falling hazard. Remember, you want to do a study where you take care of people. At minimum, you cannot do them, put them at any risk or in any harmful way. So if you want to say like, okay, do this, it's like, no, you're not. Stand on a balance beam. No, you're not. Okay. Have them sit in a chair. <clears throat> what kind of chair? Is this chair sufficiently stable? How do you know? Okay. Um, we're worrying about things at that level. Okay. Uh, two, that we're going to have multiple, mo multiple devices for interacting. Why? Because we have different movements that we're trying to uh, recover and rehabilitate. So, uh, so we've got nine different devices. You'll see them in a moment. None of them will surprise you. Okay. Uh, we have eight kinds of upper extremity movements, uh, which deals with things like distal to proximal. Okay. Now you have to watch me to see what I'm going to do next. Okay, so I cross the center line. Okay, by crossing the center line, I've also crossed the brain, uh, the hemispheric uh, divide. Because of course, your the side's on the left, and so by doing this, it lights up the activity on the right, even though it's the right arm. So, because what we're gonna try to do, uh, so this is one movement, this is another kind of movement, pinching, shaking, twisting, holding, uh, and we developed uh, 25 mini games. These are not games that you're gonna look and go like, oh, this is, this is better than League of Legends or Dota 2. No, no. These are games that do one thing. They're sing what we call a single mechanic. They're played for 30, between 30 and 300 seconds. Because again, if you've lost ability and you're asking somebody to hold a device, like a, a wireless mouse, like, it's a challenge to have them, you know, 
to hold it, try to stabilize it. And they are focused on trying to stabilize it, but you can't frustrate them, especially if you know that one out of three of them isn't going to have a bad day. They're going to hate you, potentially, for this. Um, and I've also introduced this idea of cultural diversity in the games in that once you see what the devices are, uh, they code for different social values. Again, something that we just pick the devices and then after seeing how people react, it's like, oh, they're coded. And an example will be, uh, everyone familiar with a Nintendo Wiimote? Anyone not familiar with a Nintendo? Okay, no hands. <laughs> uh, so they have, an, uh, they have a fixture which looks like a plastic gun. You put the Wiimote in the gun and you can sort of have games where you do targeting. Okay. Now it turns out there are lots of people who when they see a gun, they know what they want to do with it. It's America. And you have other people, because it's America, who see a gun and it's like, I will not touch that. Okay, now if it's in a therapeutic context, it's like, oh, well, now we have the duck shooting game. So we see there, those are going to be people like, yeah, I'm ready. You know, or, you know, again, I don't want to try to mime it in a, uh, but, and it's like, okay, well, how do we, you know, we have to embrace the fact that people are different and that you can't, you know, that the devices are not neutral relative to their values. Okay, so, uh, you know, think about is a mouse culturally specific? Okay, that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. Oh, and then we're going to have our back end system. So, here's sort of a picture. This is a lab picture, so uh, has the natural clutter associated with it. Yes, this is the Hammer of Thor. Those who uh, recognize. Uh, but it turns out it's actually <coughs> foam rather than uh, whatever it is, the steel. Uh, so it's a very lightweight thing. But you see here, uh, if you're familiar with arcade machines, uh, you know, these are ink arcade buttons because that's actually what they are. We get in there. These are big arcade buttons. We have a touch pad, we have a dial, twist dial, have a mile armband if you've seen those, um, a joystick. Um, uh, military grade, they were impressed by that. Um, we have a PSI toy. Um, we have a uh, device that we made, which is a piece of PVC, which has a little pressure or force transducer on it. So you just grab it, so it senses uh, the change of pressure uh, through a force gradient. Okay, and then uh, we have games. So. Uh, the person on the left who's a volunteer uh, patient is playing uh, a game that's basically whack-a-mole, if everybody understands whack-a-mole, okay, which in this case, uh, you see on the display, uh, white is lit, and he used the hammer of Thor to hit the corresponding uh, button. By the way, people love this game. <laughs> You might be able to guess a bit why, because it's like there's not often you get to use a hammer as a play toy. Okay, even though it's form, they get this. And it's that intrinsic motivation hook that we're looking at. The game on the right, which uses that continuous style, is you have uh, these iconic uh, tokens that sort of stream, and you have to twist the dial by twisting that thing that, as you see, it's distal and rotational. So it's a challenging movement. Uh, now these games are uh, multi-level. Again, this is all it does. Just streams token and you just twist the dial. You have a time limit um, and the therapist can control the rate and the randomization at which these arrive. So typically early in a therapy session of a multi-week uh, thing, these will come in at a rate of maybe one every five seconds or one every 10 seconds, because that's the kind of performance you see, okay? It's like, move the mouse to here. We'll give you five to 10 seconds to do it. Now again, if you have you know, full ability, you're like, okay? Because that's what full ability means, okay? If you have very limited ability, it's like, 
you, you, you know where you're at, you know where you want to be, but the path, you don't have a stable control path to get you there. Okay. So, uh, oh, we built three dozen of these things. No, we built in the lab. Uh, we hired high school students to come in on weekends and screw things together. Um, this, uh, this uh, everything here is available retail with the exception of this device, meaning we literally bought it from Amazon. Um, and why is that significant? Uh, if you have a device that's available to the public without prescription, it's automatic, it's subject to an FDA waiver. You don't have to get the FDA waiver if you can just go buy it off of Amazon. So um, let's try to do that. Uh, from a HCI or software engineering perspective, all of these devices end up looking like a mouse <coughs> or a keyboard. You know, so that's just, uh, so these things are just, you know, XY devices, these things are point or key. Uh, X, Y, X, X, Y. We're not doing any 3D with this configuration, but we'll show you how we deal with that uh, later. So, um, uh, integrated PC, it's about $1,500 retail unit one. Not free, but it's not 15,000. It's not 85,000. The clinical systems that we're looking at are in that 15,000 to 85,000 and don't have this set of diversity yet. Okay, so um, one of the things we're trying to work with is, uh, you know, we had people come as like, gee, you know, that's kind of clunky looking HCI. It's like, well, first, we're not trying to say this is elegant. We're trying to say it's purposeful. It's focusing on the, this is here for a reason. You have to reach for it. If you're, again, if you're sitting here, with, imagine that's where your center line is. To reach across over here <coughs> is a different movement than doing this. This is easy. This is more challenging. That's hard. You know, just that kind of, because again, if you, it's, it's hard to replicate the, you know, the challenge that people have to just even do that. Okay. So this is an idea of where, uh, this is work actually that uh, Crystal Lopes participated in with some of her students. Uh, so this is an AR-based uh, scheme where we have a projector projecting the game surface onto the table uh, and then uh, a camera trying to track it. This, I was not involved in the design of this because I looked at that and went, whoa, that's way too complicated to do it. I'm trying to do which is just make a mouse, okay? that you can track. But this was an interesting capability in that um, if you give people therapy, you have to train them for what to do. And if they have cognitive neglect, they may have forgotten, or they may not be. So you have to make it literal. So it's a near transfer, not a far transfer from a cognition standpoint. So I suggested we make videos of, you know, put your arm here. And now you can just, this is part of how we do training. Just follow, you know, so it's, uh, which reduces the barrier to, again, um, this is things that once you see it explained, it becomes more obvious than if you don't think about it. But if you have somebody looking at a desktop display versus a tabletop display, uh, this is a second person perspective review. This is a first person view. And if you have cognitive neglect, you may not be able to do geometric transformations of 2D to 1D or 2D to control. Um, and we found just by changing the presentation from desktop to tabletop, we saw an improvement in a, in a preliminary uh, clinical trial, 20% in movement accuracy, 15% less variability. This is within the first week. So again, we start recovering capability quite quickly just based on where the information can be presented. Again, once you see it, it's like, wow, that's pretty s simple to do. 
But again, we're all used to, no, the world's this. Okay, and it's like, okay. So the fact that it is AR is, if you will, is inconsequential. It's really going from desktop to tabletop. And we also got feedback from the therapist about, uh, they said, okay, so, you know, your clinical setup here, you know, if you have somebody here, it's like, okay, I'm reaching for that blue button. system can't see any of this. All it can see is when I hit the button. Okay. Uh, versus, or worse, oh, you know, my kitty, who I love to have in my lap, just decided to walk. It's like, we're not making this up <laughs> because we've seen it happen. Uh, or another one is I've had the grandchild over and they're sitting in my lap and uh, they want to play. So we uh, we have you know we've tr to try to be adaptive. We're looking for a way to try to get a third dimension of movement. And so this is a student who's prototyped the system, uh, which is using a um, you know a vision module um, with a infrared you know, blah blah you know tech that just is, you know, can it see, you know, sort of your, 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 your two dimensions of, if you will, of your spine and your shoulder plane. And when you move, you see how uh, we can actually see the deflection. And that starts to tell us things like, oh, by the way, when you do that proximal move, we want you to do it like this, not like because this turns out to be maladaptive, it makes you worse than this, which is, you know, and it's like, well, okay, um, maladaptive, not good. Okay, uh, so, you know, this, this is an evolving uh, system, because again, we're out there putting this in people's homes for a period of uh, six weeks uh, with a therapeutic plan that's now controlled by um, Therapist. So this is the back-end system that the therapist works with. And so what they get to do is, uh, you know, we've created a, a decision support system, if you will, uh, that allows them to uh, provide an interpretive diagnosis of, okay, so the patient's suffering from decreased proximal strength. Remember proximal? So, you know, they have that kind of a thing. They may be better out here than here. So that's kind of that. The, the, you'll see the wrist limp as it's close, but as it gets out, it can kind of pop up. Okay. Uh, and then for each of these, there's, there's a set of one or more games that you can play to focus on recruiting that circuit so that you can help develop it. And that turns into a care plan, which is then uh, supplemented with a set of instructional material or if you will, this is what's called the, uh, uh, we would refer to it as a best practice, they call it the standard of care. Okay. So you have people do exercises independent of us, so this is an educational component because this is what the therapists know. They know how to tell you like, okay, we're gonna do a bilateral uh, a horizontal sh uh, shoulder abduction with tubing. You're like, oh, uh, what? Oh, we're going to give you a rubber hose and you stretch it. Oh, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, but, because uh, again, when you work with domain experts, they want to see their domain constructs built into the system. This is just using, you know, to just say, oh, well, guess what? We can collect all of the data on every interaction or transaction with the system, hit a button, pull the trigger, uh, scratch it, we have time duration, uh, but again, you, there's no three dimensions, so we, you know, we can tell when you hit this button and when you hit this button, but we don't know what happened in between. Um, uh, we do data analytics, uh, no magic here, but just to say, this is the kind of stuff that then we, in providing to the therapist, uh, they can use to adapt the plan. Now, we also have implemented an algorithmic procedure, which just does optimization, but we don't force 
the therapist to take the algorithmic recommendation. That's again a participatory decision making uh, kind of a thing because in places like the US, uh, healthcare reimbursement for therapists entails the following. Let me use Judith. You have to, a therapist who doesn't put hands on a patient is not doing therapy if you want to get reimbursed. So uh, Medicare uh, insurance kind of thing. So it's like, okay, so we have to figure out we can't get rid of therapists, not that we want to. Uh, so this is not like, well, gee, just get machine intelligence and AI agents and we can, do it's like, you're not solving the problem that's here. You're solving a fantasy problem, okay? Uh, you have to have the therapist involved because they're part of the current institutional process. Now, um, this is all IRB uh, compatible. So we have cameras. Uh, there's a video conferencing system built in, as well as a video capture. Uh, so this is a patient who's been anonymized. So you see, here's the system installed in their home. Uh, and in particular, for me, one of the more important pictures is this one. You can see what's going on here. Doing this. We have the good arm helping the weak arm. That's not what we want, okay? Uh, but again, it's part to think, you know, it's not like, no, 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 don't do that. It's like, how often are they doing this? Is the challenge too much for them? Uh, because again, they have weekly uh, conference, uh, video conferences with the, with the therapist who can watch them do play. Um, the therapy in order to determine if, for example, they're doing these comp compensatory uh, activities. So, um, why? Because one of the things we found is uh, people really like this. I'm not trying to say that we've done a good job, but I am willing to say people like what we're giving them um, and that they are intrinsically motivated. They feel themselves getting better, so they Look, you know, it's just that kind of natural, I want to do better. Because this is giving me positive feedback. It's like, okay, oh, okay, now we've seen this. Now how do we, you know, now that's the therapist challenge to say, okay, can you do it without holding it? Well, yeah, I can't do it as well. Well, that's what we want you to focus on. Okay, so we're at the end here. Uh, so, okay, I'm a software engineer, I'm a game guy, so I want to go like, hey, here's how to make this even uh, better. So, uh, everything you saw was one person as a user, okay? And uh, we're trying this idea of how to socialize rehab so that if I have a stroke and you have a stroke and we each have the system, we can engage in cooperative activity, including communication. Uh, well, let me type you a message. Nope, typing's not gonna happen, because if you can type, you are not our target, okay? Because you don't have diminished ability. So, you know, think about how do I type with big buttons, okay? So we conjured up this notion of emoji chat, because yes, you've all seen the Disney movie, you know, of you have the emotions by color, Okay, and so you have buttons by color, and so, hey Walt, how are you feeling today? Let's see, where's the crappy button? <laughs> crap, 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 crap. Oh, we've just had an emotional expression, volunteer. Uh, they didn't have to type it out, they could just do a therapeutic motor activity. Keep them engaged, keep them doing activity, but enable them to communicate. There's also a peer engagement aspect we're looking to. Uh, how do we make this work for larger audiences over a long time frame? We're dealing now with four to six weeks. We're trying to get to six months uh, and then eventually upwards of two years because the anecdotal stories of uh, major recovery indicate therapeutic practice four to six hours a day, six days a week, one to two years. It's like, 
that's a very high cost challenge. And again, if you're, remember those people at the beginning? These are not kids, these are people uh, in their senior age, typically. If you're young and have a stroke, you can be young and have a stroke. Those people tend to recover, even, or if they have impairment. They're motivated to get it back. Uh, if you've lived a long life and you now can't move your arm, you know, or you, you know it's like, can I grab my grandson? Like, that's an engagement, that's a motivation. Uh, can I pick up my coffee? I can use my other hand. Can I wash my face? I can, you know. So, um, and then what can we do globally? Okay, so it took a little bit more time than I wanted, but uh, so this is something that they keep wanting me to help share is this idea of like everything we've talked about uh, or much of what we talk about is not unique to the medical condition called stroke. It also applies to central nervous system injuries, which can be from uh, traumatic brain injury or uh, neuromusculoskeletal injuries. That those are body traumas, usually automobile accidents, uh, diabetes, dementia, uh, and the like. That's kind of the pitch for the business plan, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, and if you've never looked at the clinicaltrials.gov, um, do it for perverse curiosity, because uh, if you've got an NIH clinical trial, it has to be registered usually at clinicaltrials.gov, and we live under this address, and we're called this. Um, and uh, if everyone knows what a non-inferior research design is, Gee, don't we teach research methods here? <laughs> yeah, that one got me too. Um, so, uh, if in a randomized clinical trial, okay, so you have a group that gets the intervention and a group that doesn't. Okay, if you've got people with injuries, stroke, you can't give them a placebo because it could make them worse. Okay, so you have to give them a non-inferior method. So if we give them in the intervention group the game-based system, then the non-intervention group gets the best standard of care or the gold standard that doesn't involve computing. So meaning they get improved according to the current dogma of how we can rehab them. So that means they get very, they get lots of um, rubbery plastic, rubbery toys to play with you know, which are like plastic hoses or rubber hoses and twist things and so. stuff. Questions? Did you learn anything today? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, one of the other things. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Um, some, I mean, I also have old parents. They luckily did not have a stroke yet, but they suffer from other things. One of the things that I noticed is that uh, if you are a patient with suffering from this kind of immediate event, so of course the relationship also towards the immediate social environment changes. And I was wondering if you have ever, uh, any evidence that this kind of gamification approach in the house does have also positive consequences for the relationship between the patient and its family members. Well, that's, um, uh, hopefully everybody heard the question. So that's part the, um, where did, oh, sorry, so the slide. Okay, where we talked about this idea of socializing rehab. So um, a common scenario is uh, grandma had a stroke, but little Maria and cousin Bobby have PCs at home. And is there a way that they could do an activity that grandma could also do? So we, we have a prototype concept of basically having uh, small multiplayer gameplay where we can have what we call equalized play mm -hmm. so that if you know if Bobby can do this playing a game and grandma is like think think that we let Bobby do this but it's normalized to the rate at which grandma can so like a handicap 
yeah, so it's, it's equalizing uh, play field kind of thing. Uh, and it's selectable, so if grandma <coughs> wants it on or grandma. So it's part of the thing of you let each person sort of have a perceivable, I know what to do. So that's our current uh, vision for doing that. But again, the social isolation is the thing that we're trying to address. And if you've got an IT system in the home, okay, we know lots about how to people can socialize online, but again, now you have to think about, right, we know how to do it once you have full ability. And now if you take away the ability, you know, like, oh gee, I don't, you know, oh, gesture control, it's like, yeah, you ever seen gesture that's, you know, I'm just trying to hit this spot, okay? Uh, so, uh, so, it's a good question, but a nice challenge. Jeff? Yeah, but, um, I was really struck with what you said uh, before about, well, you can't, sorry, there's, the project has seemed difficult with doing participatory uh, design because of the cognitive um, um, disabilities and the um, you know and the depression. Um, but it strikes me that that's not a very good re that's not a sufficient reason for not doing participatory design. Oh no, I'm not uh, saying. No, not, no, I was no, just pointing to the gap. No, I know you're pointing to the gap, but I was just wondering. I mean, how, how would you start to address <coughs> participation in this kind of audience? Because you not only want to measure. Um, you know whether they're getting better at their distal and proximal and whatever. You want to measure you know, how are they how are they interacting with it? How's this working? Sure, through? sure. So uh, since we have one of our my colleagues here, you, uh, we have started. Uh, uh, raise your hand, please. Okay. Hi. So uh, she's doing qualitative field work now, mm -hmm. going into people's homes to talk to them about. Okay, now that you've had this experience, uh, sort of you know, give it, collect feedback for us, uh, but not just feedback in terms of does A work better than B, but things like, uh, you know, <clears throat> sort of questions of what's missing or what kind of information would you want the system to give you that you don't have? And again, it's part of the thing of the framing seems to be, well, some people will be able to give me this kind of input, you know, which we narrowly uh, construe as sort of people who are engineering, rational engineering kind of. So they kind of embrace that idea of, oh, data-driven participation. Other people, it's like giving them, you know, visual feedback. Of, <coughs> what am I doing with this? It's like giving them the game. They can sort of get the idea of like, oh, I'm earning points. I'm reaching the goal. I get it. So. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question about the game design. Yes. Uh, so you are to use the game mechanics as a treatment for the uh, rehabilitation. Yes. So you mentioned one uh, game is uh, sitting here in front of his computer, and yes. one version of the game is uh, desktop based. And you mentioned the difference, some uh, like first person view and second person view. Yes. So I wonder uh, uh, what are some thoughts you have when designing the game, uh, using the mechanics to um, that to uh, for the rehabilitation, rehabilitation. Sure, sure. That's a nice question. So let me see if I can go back to. Okay. Oops. Yeah. The well, it's partly here. So it's it's a thing of um, as we said, uh, or I'll use the example of. So this is a game. Who's, you know, so the mechanic is twisting the dial and the physical interface device is a continuous dial. So you can see kind of there's a, in our game design perspective, a one-to-one -one mapping between, oh, use this device and its current affordance, which is twist left or twist right, okay? Which then during play is the exact mechanic that you want. Now, this is the challenge. And so, you know, as you see, uh, for here, you need to twist, twist, twist. It doesn't have stops, so you have to twist it. And you see that, well, there's a challenge of twisting too far and then adjusting. So that's kind of the, the play dynamic. So in order to come up with the kind of question that you had, so let me go back up here. Um, I asked the therapist for, well, what are the movements we want to have? And they were like, well, you want distal, proximal, and I was like, uh, show me the movement, okay? Because, uh, you know, again, you, you saw there, or was it the, uh, 
They're used to saying things like bilateral shoulder horizontal abduction. It's like, oh, uh, what? Like, <laughs> you know, bilateral shoulder horizontal. It was like, because um, whatever they got to show me, I have to go like, oh, we have a device to do that, or we don't have a device to do that. So fortunately, uh, the game design challenge is very bounded because it's like, give us the movement. What do you, what's the correct way? How do you want it sensed? You know, time, sampled, uh, iteration, precision. Uh, and then we look to say, oh, what's a game that we could build around doing that? So most of the games we have, if you see them, it's like, yeah, I've seen this game before. You know, again, it, they're, they're simple mechanics. Uh, but one of the more challenging games is fairly abstract. It has to do with that pressure thing where you have to control the amount of force that you apply. Uh, so it's a, it's a dynamic system that involves uh, pressure and hold for a duration that's dynamically assigned. So you get it like a window. It's like hold it for three seconds, except it doesn't say three. It just gives you a color bar that then, you know, kind of burns off like a fuel tank. Kind of thing. So um, all the games run on a single game engine. All the games were done by a single person. So it's pretty straightforward to do, if you will, the game challenge uh, is sort of the icing on the cake relative to the overall thing. Last question. I know it's, I'm the thing standing between you and the treats <laughs> downstairs. <so. laughs> <coughs> All right. Jeff, All right. In that away. case, can we please thank, we'll gather together, and thank Walt again for a fantastic yeah. talk. <laughs> and we invite you as our want to the sixth floor, where hopefully we have wine and cheese and assorted goodies awaiting. And, and again, if any of you know anyone in a stroke in a major metropolitan area that you'd like to have them yeah. potentially available to participate, we yeah. have the information. Available.